what I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the same. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders, and i um, here with Captain Hoff or, or Steve Hoffman. Um, before I formally introduce Steve, Steve, I always like to mention past episodes that are interesting for people to check out. And since we're in the kind of the VC universe with founder space, um, there is one with uh, Yuri Adoni, and who uh, was a part of Jerusalem Venture Partners in Israel, and he had some interesting um advice on on the whole startup world and vc world and yossi vardy of israel also invested in a lot of different startups so check those out and other ones on inspiredinsider.com and this episode is brought to you by rise 25 at rise 25 we help businesses give to and connect to their dream 100 relationships and partnerships and we do that by helping you run your podcast you know for me See, I know I could tell already, you know, this is how you are too. The number one thing in my life is relationships. And I'm always looking at way to give to my best relationships. And I've find, found no better way over the past decade to have people on my podcast, profile them, their thought leadership, their company, what they're working on and share it with the world. So if you've thought about starting a podcast, you should. Uh, if you have questions, you can go to rise25.com, email us, happy to answer any questions. My business partner and I have both been podcasting for over a decade now. So check it out. Uh, today's guest, I'm super excited and a big thank you to Michael Dillon who, uh, from Paperback Expert who introduced me to today's guest. Steve Hoffman, also known as Captain Hoff. He's a CEO of Founderspace and Founderspace is a global startup accelerator with over 50 partners in 22 countries, 50,000 entrepreneurs as members. Um, every year he mentors hundreds of startups and helping them overcome their biggest challenges. And Founderspace was ranked the number one incubator for overseas startups by Forbes and Entrepreneur Magazine. He also is a venture investor, serial entrepreneur. I don't know how you have the time, you know, Steve, to basically author books. So he has several award-winning books, Make Elephants Fly, Surviving a Startup, and The Five Forces. Thanks for joining me. Fantastic to be here. So I wanted to start off with early on, um, and what led you to be an entrepreneur. And we'll talk about some of your early entrepreneur endeavors. And what I found out was interesting is your dad was an MIT rocket scientist. He was, he trained the early astronaut. That's amazing. So what led you to being an entrepreneur? Well, it wasn't a straight path. Like so many things in life, it, I went everywhere. I like to say I've had more careers than cats have had lives. So I, I've done all sorts of different things from being a manga rewriter to a voice actor, a com electrical computer engineer, game designer, you name it, I've done it, Hollywood film executive. And I finally wound up where I am today, which is an entrepreneur and venture capitalist. So take me through the winding road a little bit. What I found interesting from your story is initially it sounded like your dad told you the future was computers and you were like, that's not my thing necessarily. I want to do this entertainment thing and movies. And you actually did cold outreach to people in Hollywood. So you were flexing your copywriting skills. What, what worked? And the same thing goes probably through your whole entrepreneur. You guys got to get a hold of hard to reach people. So what works? What worked for you then when you're trying to get a Hollywood uh, producers, a hold, you know, hold of them, and then what works just to get a hold of hard to reach people? I will tell you, I'm a big believer in if you want to do something and you don't know the right people, don't let that hold you back. You can go out there and actually make those connections. And I've done it throughout my life. So my first big attempt was when I graduated film school. And everybody knows what a film degree is worth. It doesn't get you anywhere. Like it's great when you're in film school and making student films, but you go into the real world and nobody seems to care. So what I did when I graduated was I literally wrote 150 letters to the top production companies and producers in Hollywood, sent them out everywhere and waited and prayed that somebody would respond to me. 
Well, I got lucky. I got three responses out of 150. The first response that I received was from the producer of Star Wars Empire Strikes Back. He called me up. So I pick up the phone. I'm a co recent college grad. I was like, hello. And he was like, I'm the producer of Star Wars Empire Strikes Back, but I don't have a job for you. He had no job. He just wanted to say hi and give me encouragement. So Steve, why do you think he responded? What was it about your letter in it? I wrote a funny letter. So my letter was humorous. And I will tell you, humor will get you a long way. Like you, if you take yourself too seriously all the time, think about it. These guys get hundreds of letters a year. You know, everybody wants to break into Hollywood. So actors are writing them, actresses, you know, want to be writers, want to be directors, you name it. They're all writing. Agents are contacting them. I wrote a humorous letter. And I think that is what got these three precious responses. Mm. Well, the first response didn't amount to anything, but it's, it, it was fun. I tell you, I'm a Star Wars fan, so it was a thrill. Uh, the second call I got back was from Disney. And I was like, oh, I got it made. So the head of Disney production invites me in. And I start talking. The interview is going great. I, I'm sure I'm going to get this job working at Disney. And then she asks me a trick question. Do you know what that is? She asked me what films I like. And I had just come out with a master of fine arts degree from a top film school. And I was into all these art films and experimental films and you name it. I was into it because I'd spent three years studying and watching these. So I started to rattle off all these directors I liked. And her face just dropped because I didn't mention any Disney films. And you know what? After that question, I was out the door. She couldn't wait to get me out of her office fast enough. So I did not get the Disney job. That's a lesson to you when you are meeting somebody from a company, be sure to mention their films. Yeah, I'm sure the same thing happens with you when uh, companies pitching you as a VC and they are maybe not familiar with what you've done or in the genre that you like to invest in. Um, and we'll get into some of the common questions that you get a lot of on in, in venture capital world, but tell me um, about Lava Mind. Okay. Well, I will tell you about Lava Mind. So I did the film thing, went through, got worked my way up the ladder. The third time I got that job, I nailed it and worked my way up to TV development executive. Then I met the founder of a game company called Sega, and they had just surpassed Nintendo. So that sent me on a new path because I also have an electrical computer engineering degree. So I, want, I saw the future of games. So I went to Japan, designed games for a while, then came back to my home, which is Silicon Valley. And I wanted to start my own company. I had that itch. I was like, I could make my own games. I don't have to work for anybody. I could do this. So I basically started coding the games myself. So coding everything, it was just me and my wife doing it all together. You know, she would do the artwork. I would do the coding. I'd, I'd do the game design. We produced the game. We, our goal was we didn't know anybody again in this industry. I just keep switching industries. I didn't know anybody in the game industry. I, I knew some people in Japan, but nobody in Silicon Valley. And I didn't know anybody in the venture capital industry, so I couldn't raise money. We just self-funded it. And we uploaded that game to the internet. And this was the early days of the internet. It was bulletin boards. They weren't even websites. And the first person who downloaded and purchased our game was named Lord Gek. Now you can imagine the type of person in the early days of the internet who's downloading shareware games. Well, that was him. We actually invited him to our house for dinner because he was the first person who bought our game. And we talked to him and he, you know, what gave was us... the game? Well, oh, the game was ironically very similar to what I do today. So I wanted to make a nonviolent game that would help people better themselves. So a game that taught entrepreneurship and it was called Gazillionaire. 
And it's this really wacky game, like in outer space, where you're running a simulated business, a simulated company in space. And kind of like Elon Musk. You, you were kind of, like, a... uh, yeah, a, a virtual Elon Musk. Yeah. We made this game. It was a work of passion. It was something that I just really cared about. It was a game I thought would help a lot of people and I thought would be really fun to play. So I put it out there and we waited. We got Lord Geck to buy it. Other people were buying it online, but small amounts of money, you know, very little, not even enough to live up. And then the game got in the hands of the testers. They're called quality assurance testers at the largest PC game publishing company in the world at that time. It was called Spectrum Holobyte Microprose. And the testers fell in love with it. And they came to us basically and wanted to license our game and they put it out there. So it went all over the world. So that first product we did actually became a big success. So Gazillionaire took off. We went on and made a whole series of these games. Uh, another one called Zapitalism, another one called Profitania, and they are all business learning games. And they went out to the general public and then they went out to schools and universities. The California prison system uses them to uh, reform convicts and they're still selling like many decades later. Wow, that's amazing. So was that the company like under the umbrella of Lava Mine? That was Lava Mine. That was, Lava Mine was a game company. We felt like we were erupting with ideas. We were making our own games. And then along comes this thing called the internet, the World Wide Web. Like it was brand new. And my friend from film school, she was working in New York and they, she was working with this engineer and they just done one of the very first online games for Microsoft. Hmm. And they, they owned basically all the technology behind it. So she approached me and said, let's partner and bring online games, you know, to the world, massively multiplayer online games. And I thought, wow, this is going to be a big thing. Like, you know, I'm a gamer. I know games. That's where my nickname comes from, Captain Hoff, my gamer handle. And I thought, well, let's do this. So we launched my second company, which is called Spider Dance. So talk about Spider Dance. So I want to also point to, so at one point I did have the, uh, at one point he was the he's past CEO of Sega, Tom Kalinske, and he was talking about console wars, which was a book at the time talking about Sega and Nintendo and the, the battle that defined a generation. So people could check out that episode. And um, it, it was just interesting to hear. You didn't see the behind the scenes. I mean, I, I was playing all those Sega and Nintendo. So I, I love it. So talk about spider dance. So Tom and I crossed paths many times. Did you? Okay. Nice. Yeah. And one of them was with spider dance. Okay. And so we basically uh, launched spider dance and our mission, you know, was we didn't know what we were going to do. We just knew we had this technology, but we didn't know what we would build. So like all entrepreneurs, we had some ideas. So our first idea, which, which I thought was great, was we would build a platform so that anybody out there who wanted to develop massively multiplayer online games could use our platform instead of building it themselves. Mm. Well, this seemed like a brilliant idea, but in the world and like in my books, I write, I explain this because I've lived through it. It doesn't matter how great an idea seems in your head because it has to be right for the time. Like we were early. This was the very beginning. We went out with our platform to all these developers and they were like, nah, I'll just build it myself or I'll give you a tiny, tiny, tiny portion of the revenue to, to use your platform. Yet, I want a huge amount of changes for you to customize it for me. So we were so early that it was, we couldn't make a business out of it. So we quickly pivoted like many startups do. And we thought we're gonna make online games. Now chat was taking off. People were chatting online. It was a big thing at the time. Mm -hmm. To Java's give people a sense, Steve, what year what year is oh, it at this point? This is the 90s, like, okay. like 19, what, 95, 96, 98. What, that, what that was time. on the internet at this point? I mean, there was no Google at that point. I mean, what was around then? Oh, so it was the when things were just taking off. So Netscape was the big browser company. There were, um, it was the beginning of the dot-com boom, the very beginning of the dot-com boom. And all these companies were getting funded right and left. And we were like in the midst of it. And we, you know, our engineer. So your dad was right. 
My dad, oh, my yeah. dad was right. Yeah, <laughs> when he told me to study electrical computer engineering and not go to film school, his initial advice was right on target. But I sort of ended up combining them both. And that's what got me. You to made where, your way back around. Yeah, I did. Yeah. And, and so I'm half technology, kind of half creative. That is me. So we started doing this JavaScript game. We put it out there. It was called Jabber Chat. You chat. With, and there would be games as you chat, like word games as you chat with people. Really fun, really creative. You could plug it into any website. It spread like crazy. We had hundreds of sites using Jabber Chat, you know, just overnight. And you know what happened? We needed money because at this point, we we're really low on money. So we decided we were going to embed advertising in this. Like there was a company that just came out with advertising, not Google. They weren't there yet. They were another company. And we took their ads and embedded it in. We said, with all these users, we're bound to make money. Guess what? We waited to the end of the month to get our check. And when our check arrived, it was like $12.58. It wasn't enough to buy a pizza. For, it was like so little money. So we were like, we can't make money this way. Jabberchat, meanwhile, was doing great. It, got, it won South by Southwest as the number one interactive game. It was like doing incredibly well, but it was so early in the internet that we had to abandon it because we were basically running out of cash. So we heard that MTV was going to launch an interactive television show, the first massive one to like millions of people across their whole network. And Amit Zappa was hosting. It was a music trivia game show. And we thought we could wed our engine, our massively multiplayer game engine, with this TV show and create interactive TV where we synchronize them completely. Well, we started calling MTV. Just like I wrote letters to those producers, we, were, we found out the name of the executive producer at MTV. We were, uh, we were calling them, asking them, hey, Hey, we, we're Spider Dance. We have a solution for you. Guess what? They never called back. We didn't get a single call. Like nobody called us. So um, my partner, she actually got invited to speak at CES because of her previous job. So she yeah. went ahead and spoke. And if people at don't know the Consumer Electronic Show, that's a Consumer Electronic Show. Yes. That, yeah, which is huge. If anyone doesn't know, it's in Vegas. I don't know if at the time it was in Vegas, but it is massive. It's like the, all the big players are at CES. Yes. So because of her project with Microsoft, she got invited to speak there. So she was on a panel and she starts talking about our company. She was like, Spider Dance is going to do this. Spider Dance is going to make interactive television. All this stuff. We hadn't built it yet, but we kind of had the basis for it. And she was talking about it after her talk. This guy comes running up from the audience, pushes his way through and goes, goes up to her and says, you have exactly what I need. I am the senior vice president of MTV Interactive. <laughs> and she goes, I know, we've been leaving voicemails for you. So literally that one talk got us to where we needed to be. We got, all, they basically funded our company with $350,000 in kind of bootstrap money. And we built the product took it to market, launched it, but it was a crazy, rocky ride. What do you consider, Steve, in this journey, the first big success that you had? You know, because I know in this entrepreneurial journey, it's there's twists and turns, and usually the first thing someone starts is not really necessary. It, it totally changes as, as the journey goes on. What do you well, consider the first big success? Well, with Spider Dance, as you can see, we went through two different things. And only on the third thing did we, we hit success. Did we actually get enough to, money to get our company going? And meanwhile, we were having a lot of trouble raising venture capital. There were no startup incubators at the time. There was no like real community like there is today with meetup groups and all this stuff in Silicon Valley. And I didn't know anybody. So we were darn lucky to get that deal. But if you go back to my history of what I was doing, the first big success was Gazillionaire. Like that uh, gave me the confidence, got me where I was going and, you know, ended up producing a lot of revenue, especially like today, like over its lifetime, it's been enormous. So, um, however, with Spider Dance, we still faced like huge goals, like 350,000 seemed like a lot of money when we got it, but we had to build out this huge platform that had never been built out. We had to synchronize in a frame accurate way what's online on your PC 
to a broadcast television network. And I will tell you, if we were a few frames off, people could cheat in the game because they would see it on TV before they saw it on the internet and they would know the answer. So it literally had to work every time. And that was an enormous undertaking, very stressful. We only had three engineers. We, we had one to start with, we hired two more. And I was like helping design the game while going out and trying to raise venture capital. And we, and I learned a lot of lessons here. Like now I teach entrepreneurs how to raise capital. Well, I learned the hard way how to raise capital because I went out to these investors and a lot of them would say, oh, that's great, that's great, we wanna fund you. And they would do nothing. And I would spend so much time, you know, following after them, following up with them, trying to get them to commit. Finally, I got one investor that said they would commit to the deal. They were this big Hollywood company, uh, uh, you know, venture firm. They had like Michael Milken on the board and all these other people, uh, stars on the board. And they, uh, they promised us $5 million. So we, we spent a huge amount on lawyers for us, which was like $60,000. If you think about our budget, we had very little money. And we negotiated the entire contract. We get down to the end of the contract where we had everything done. And they told us, we won't give you the money now. We will give you the money after you launch. We want to see if you can launch the product. So, you know, this was made it doubly stressful because everything was hanging on the launch of that product. And at this time, when you launch a product, first of all, we had no way to really load test it. There wasn't AWS. There were no scalable systems. Like li literally, we were building the, it all ourselves in like a co-location facility and the hardware. And, you know, there was not, it's so easy today <laughs> compared to what it was then. So we had, no, what, we had no idea what would happen when MTV would start driving in literally a million users onto our platform. You know, how, would it even work? So, but we just kept building. We had no choice. We had committed to doing this to MTV. We get up to launch date and the MTV president, senior vice president is really nervous because he's like, TV doesn't go down. We have put ads, like literally for an entire month, they've been blanketing MTV with ads, like driving all their customers to it. He goes, this better work. So we put it up there. We launched the show. It goes live on national television. Everything's going great. And then all of a sudden it crashes, like right in the middle of the first episode, like it crashed. The senior vice president calls me up on the phone and just starts cursing me, like cursing me out, like, you know, every word. And, and I said, just hold on, just hold on. I call my engineers. I talked to them. They said, you know what happened? Somebody is doing a denial of service attack on our network. A denial of service, like this was the early days, like nobody protected against those. Like we didn't even know like they were what to do, but our engineers were really smart. So they were just going crazy, blocking IP addresses, block, 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 block. And they got it under control. Within five minutes, it was back on air, literally back on air, everything running. Five perfectly. minutes seems like an eternity when that's happening, I'm sure. I was on the floor dying. <laughs> was having a heart attack. Like this is the end of our company. MTV would drop us. Our venture investors wouldn't invest. Everything we had done, the, the past nine months of hell we had gone through to get this product live would be for nothing. So, uh, but it got back on air. Everything ran smoothly. The, everybody got to play along. The end, we pumped the names of the winners back into the live broadcast, went great. So I was so relieved. And we figured out how to block denial of service attacks in the process. We go to the investors like the next day. I was like calling them up. Okay, wire us the money. We got a deal. Send us a signed contract. They went back to us because they knew we were totally out of money. They knew we like spent everything we had to get to the point and we were desperate. So they came back to us and said, we will give you the money, but we want to cut your valuation in half. In half. This left me in a really tough position. I was furious. My partners were furious. Like, you don't, I mean, these guys were taking advantage of us when they had promised something else. Do we want them on our board of directors? Do we want to have to even deal with people like this? We said, no, we, you either meet our valuation or we're walking. They didn't, we walked. 
Now, at the moment we said it, it felt really good. Like, <laughs> screw you, we're going our own way. But it just happened to be right before Christmas. All the venture capitalists were going away. We had no other parties ready to invest. We were entirely broke. That was the worst Christmas I ever had. <laughs> or in case my case, I'm Jewish, so it's Hanukkah. Like there was no Hanukkah fairy coming around for me. It was really brutal. Um, we were dying. The last year at CES, it was like a miracle, right? We got the project. This year, CES rolled around. My partner and I went to CES. We were so depressed. We could only afford the cheapest, crungiest hotel in Las Vegas. And we were literally so depressed. We were lying on the bed and couldn't bring ourselves to even go in and see CES. We just went because we had bought the plane ticket. And we came back to Silicon Valley. It's like a month has passed. We have no investors, totally desperate, but we didn't give up. Like this is what I tell entrepreneurs, like no matter how bad it gets, you just got to keep going. So we went to a company called Macromedia and they are now Adobe. They became Adobe. They merged and became Adobe. So Macromedia at the time, the president invited me in and he said, you know, we're interested in investing. I was like, great, give us the money. He goes, but I want to know if you can take your platform and move it over to Flash. Flash was their brand new product on the internet. You know, that was going to power our, the experience for all the consumers. I said, absolutely, no problem. We will get it on Flash. Let's do a deal. He goes, hold on. We can't lead the round. You have to get a, a Silicon Valley venture capital firm, a top tier firm to lead the round. Only then can we come in. Oh, that killed me. Like, like he was promising something, but he couldn't deliver. But he said, I will introduce you to some firms and we will see how it goes. Well, I knew it was now or nothing. So I said, yes, like this is all we have. Literally, we're going to out, run out, out of money at the end of the month. And we, we had already asked our employees to work for free, but we had to pay hosting and all these other fees. They were just like adding up. So we go to the first investor he introduces us, a big venture firm on Sand Hill Road, which is the heart of Silicon Valley venture community, invites us in and he goes to the meeting with me. Now, this might seem good, but it's also bad because I know he's gonna be listening to my pitch. And if that venture capitalist says no, we are out of business. Because like if that venture capitalist pokes holes in our business- He's thinking, oh, those are good points. Yeah, I didn't think of that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. And that's why he's doing it. I'll, I'll get out of this deal. <laughs> I won't introduce him to any more people. So we go into the meeting with the venture capital firm and I learn show no weakness. Like you do not reveal your poker hand to venture capital firms. Like you show them your hand and they're gonna screw you. Like I just got screwed in the last one. So I'm in there, I'm like, things are going great. We closed the deal with MTV, the launch went flawless, blah, 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 blah. You know, we, all these things, great things. And at the end of the meeting, he was completely stone-faced. Like he had no expression whatsoever. And he goes, excuse me. And he gets up and leaves the room. I, I look at the, the I go, I thought we were, we're dead. I look at the, the, the president of Macromedia and he's just sitting there. He doesn't know what to make of it. So we're waiting for him to come back in and tell us to go. He comes back in like 10 minutes later, kept us waiting, sits down, pushes a paper in front of me and said, here's your term sheet. I'm ready to sign. I couldn't believe it. Like I had been talking to investors for months and months and months, like an entire year of this. No, they all dragged the process out. None of them gave me a term sheet on the first meeting. It was like a miracle. And I was like, why did this happen? Why is he giving me this term sheet? Like, you know, usually they want to- Now you're skeptical. <laughs> yeah, I was like, what is it? But I remembered something I said during my pitch. And I turned to him and I, I was just casually mentioned that, the president of Macromedia, who's sitting right there, was going to take me to other investors, and they were the first. So I dropped that in there inadvertently, but I realized that he was afraid of losing the deal. Like he believed that if I walked out of the room, that he let me go out, I would take the deal to another VC and he would get cut out. So fear and greed. I tell people, the entrepreneurs, this all the time fear and greed. You know, these are what motivates investors, right? They have to be, I have kind of a rule. Investors have to be more afraid of losing the deal than they are of losing their money. If you can make that work, you make them more afraid of losing the deal than their money, you can close on the first meeting.
<laughs> it can happen. So he said, not only did he say he wanted to close the deal in the first meeting, he said he wanted to give me more money than I was asking for. I was asking for $5 million. He said he wants to give me $7 million at the same valuation that the other investor turned me down at. So I was like, great, $7 million. You can never have too much money. Like I knew what it was like to starve. I wanted, I wanted a, a buffer. I wanted insurance. But I told him, I caught myself, and I, instead of lunging at it, I said, wait. I said, we only asked you for $5 million. I cannot accept $7 million. He was shocked. Like he looked at me like, what are you saying? And I go, I'll tell you what, if you can close the deal in the next two weeks, I will take $6 million. So my strategy at that point was basically to set a deadline for closing the deal. The reason I needed it done in two weeks is because we literally couldn't go beyond two weeks. We needed that money in the bank. So, but I made it seem like I was playing hard to get. So when he heard that, he said, great, we'll close it in two weeks. And the deal was done. We got the money in the bank two weeks later. And I'll tell you, for a venture round, that's really, really fast. So, you know, the lawyers, everything that's involved, all the terms, we just nailed it. And then we were off to the races. See, that's an amazing story. I want to hear what happens next. But before I do, I want to hear, you know, you were able to attract an amazing team, you know, a rock star engineers. Um, and also they kind of had to go on the ups and downs as well with you. How do you go back to the team during these moments or time periods where, you know, you have this up and then this down? What do you go back and say, like you said, some of them you go back and they're willing to work for free, right? Which not, not everyone or most people are going to do that. So what do you go back and tell the team to keep them motivated during these times? Here's my rule. And I learned this as I went along. The thing that you cannot motivate other people, they have to motivate themselves. However, you can make it easy for them to motivate themselves. And that is literally by making them feel like this is their project as much. It's not your project, right? Your job isn't to motivate them. If it was your project, your job would be to motivate them, but it's their project too. So they should be motivating you and everybody should be motivating everybody else, right? We are all in this together. So because we had that attitude, that's what enabled us to do it. And I will tell you, when you are working with teams, it is... The number one thing you need to do when things go south, when things aren't going well, when you know everything seems like it's falling apart and you will not survive, the number one thing you need to do is not hide the truth. Like as the CEO, a lot of people, they will try to hide it from their team, right? They don't want to demoralize them. They don't want to think all, you know, all the, they don't want them to start looking for new jobs and jump ship right when they need them. But if you hide the truth, I mean, people find out anyway, but it also creates this, uh, you're not on the same team anymore. Like as soon as you're not telling them everything, you're on separate teams and they, and they no longer trust you. And the only reason they're going to really stick with you during these hard times is because they feel like it's their project too. And in order for them to feel that they feel like they trust you, you're in this with them. So I tell entrepreneurs all the time, whatever is happening with your company, you know, tell your team, like get the team in on it. Like they should know it's their, their company too. Don't they have a right to know? And, and you need to go to them and say, how can we get through this? Which is basically, you know, what we did. Like, we're like, how can we get through this? How can we stretch our, you know, almost non-existent funds to cover this period of time? What do we have to do? And everybody pitched in. At what point, Steve, did you become a VC? So when I became a VC much later, like much later, I did you know, venture startups. And, and then I started mentoring startups and helping them. I launched Founder Space, which is our startup incubator and accelerator. And as I saw really good companies, naturally, I was tempted to invest in them. And so I did that. My being a VC is really nice because it, I'm on the other side of the table, but I also have a really deep understanding of what the entrepreneur is going through, you know, I, and so I can both empathize with them give them advice, um, and really understand a lot of times whether their team is functional, whether this is a team that can take the ball and really run with it, or whether they're going to have problems in the future. 
So I want to hear about why and how you started Founder Space. Founder Space. Uh, the, I had done three venture funded startups. And after my third one, I was taking a break. Like I needed a break. And all my friends started to come to me because, you know, they were now doing startups. Everybody seems to be doing startups. And they were like, Captain Off, Captain Off, help me. Like I want to raise capital. I want to put together this business plan. What do I do? So I would sit down with them over coffee and just help them out. And they started to ask me uh, very specific questions. And so I started to answer them. And when I got home, I said, well, probably a lot of other entrepreneurs need these. I should put them up on my blog. So I created a blog. I called it Founder Space. I started posting the answers to all these questions I was getting. And more and more entrepreneurs that I didn't know started to come to me. And literally, we started to arrange roundtables where we'd introduce them to investors and marketing people and lawyers. Then we found a space in San Francisco. We set up our own incubator and accelerator space. So we had startups come in there for, we developed programs. And this was a long time. This was starting back in 2011. So a long time ago. And we just kept doing this. And then we started to get contacts from all over the world who were coming to us, you know, asking, can you come to China? Can you come to Europe? Can you come to you know, Japan? Can, all different places to help us out. So we started to expand internationally. And that's how we grew. We basically, our mission was to become the gateway between the rest of the world and Silicon Valley. You know, when I was doing research, Steve, it seems like Founder Space is, is pretty well known in China. We are, and that's a, a whole nother story. It's, it's crazy. You know, I wasn't planning on doing anything in China at all. I don't know Chinese. I never studied, you know, Chinese history or anything. I was invited there because Founder Space was doing well. And somebody invited me to come over and give a talk. And I thought, wow, free trip to China. I've never been there. Let's go. I, you know, I'm a curious person. So I took them up on their offer, flew to China, gave a talk, Met a few people, came back, thought that was the end of it. Then what I get was the enough, talk about? What did they want you to talk about? They wanted to talk me to talk about founder space, like how to do an incubator. So this was right at the time when China was just starting to launch their own startup incubators and accelerators. I mean, Alibaba was a big hit. You know, they had Tencent, WeChat. Those were going, but they didn't really have a startup ecosystem. Like there wasn't the support there. And they decided, oh, we want to have startups too, just like everywhere in the world. But they're China, they're a huge country. So they invited me back to give another talk. And I went back there and gave another talk. And then all these people started to approach me to do deals. Like they're like, we'll take your founder space into China. Boo, 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 boo. Now, I don't know Chinese. I don't know China, how business is done in China. I was very wary. And so I was like, I'm not going to just hand you all the rights to founder space. I don't know you. I don't know what's going on. But I was interested in the opportunity to grow founder space. So I ended up taking my time and I would meet with people. We'd do events or small things like I was doing in other countries. And then I saw an opportunity to actually launch with our partner, the first founder space there in Shanghai. And it just started to take off. At the same time, I published my first book, Make Elephants Fly, which is all about how startups innovate, come up with a big idea and get it off the ground, make it fly. So that book had just come out in the US and it was just, and a Chinese publisher picked it up like right away because I was getting known there. Hmm. And then I gave another talk, which I thought was just like all the others. But literally after I gave that talk, like, Several weeks later, somebody came up to me and said, you know, you're really famous in China. Like you are really famous. And I was like, are you serious? <laughs> I, I didn't believe them. And I just kept going about doing our business. It turned out that that talk was broadcast across all of China. And everybody was like buying my book because it had hit just at the right time. And everybody was hearing about founder space. And we were just about to open in all these new cities. And all those things converged at the same time. And I, it, I became you know, super well known there and our business just grew like crazy. And so that was my entry point into China, um, which as we know is a parallel market to the US, sort of like a whole nother, it's a whole nother universe, like very, very different. And so for me, it was just a fascinating experience to learn 
about you know, the culture, the people, the way business is done, which is just radically different than anything I had experienced anywhere else in the world. I know there's different ways people can engage with Founder Space and get involved with Founder Space. Can you break down a few of the ways that people can engage with the company? There are a lot of ways to engage with us. So uh, you can come to our site. We have lots of free content up there. Like mine, I'm sort of, I see myself, I wrote the books because I'm passionate, as you probably can tell, I'm really passionate about what I do about educating people. I think it's my father and me. He was a professor. I like to educate. So we just put up tons. We have like online startup program and we charge for those. But honestly, anybody who can't afford them, they're free. Like we make it free. Students are free, nonprofits are free, or if you're on a very limited budget, like I was when I started my company, it's free. So you can go there, get our online startup program. You can go there. Um, we have a community. We have a way for people to apply. And we have a big network of investors now, both in Silicon Valley, in the US and around the world. So you can apply for investment. We have a new uh, a product we are launching with one of our partners. Uh, it's called. It's a startup that we're we're kind of working very closely with. It's really cool. It's called Intro.VC, and it is an app. And if you could imagine Tinder uh, crossed uh, with AngelList, that's it. You know, entrepreneurs upload their video pitch, and investors can flip through it in their free time. And it's super addictive. Mm. Like I'm an investor, and like it's so easy to like go through all these video pitches and then you find the startup you like and you, you contact them. That's awesome. So intro.vc. Yeah. And then, but you also have a arm that where you advise companies, right? And you make investment too with the network. Yeah. So we usually co-invest with other investors in our network. So we will, a lot of them are angel investors. We tend to come in pretty early. Some are early stage VCs. We also have later stage VCs for the more mature companies. And uh, it's really exciting. Like we have had some amazing startups in there that you, the thing I love about working with entrepreneurs is that I'm teaching them or I'm sharing my experience with them, my knowledge, but they're also teaching me because each one of them is an expert in their field, like what they're doing. And I learned so much. So I can give you a few examples if you like. I'd love to hear some. Okay. So one of the companies I just love is called Ecubot. Now Ecubot was they came out when AI was just coming out, like just coming into vogue. And they basically launched the very first ETF, exchange traded fund powered by AI. So it was like, it's entirely AI powered. And when they did this, it just took off. Bloomberg, everybody like was, was, was writing about them and they just took off overnight. And they, they, they raised, you know, investors in their ETF went, very quickly to a billion dollars, like that ETF. And then they saw an opportunity that was even bigger than their ETF. And that was to launch an entire AI powered portfolio management platform. So they're working now with big corporations out there who have these investments that want them managed by AI and providing that whole platform. So they're really cool. Uh, another one is called Chooch AI. And Chooch AI has uh, gone out there and they, have created a platform uh, for visual analysis. Like, so you get images and actually analyzing them with AI. So they can do predictive models of things that will happen, like the spread of forest fires, things like that, that are really, really powerful. And again, they're a platform. So they're putting it out there for any company that wants to use it. There's another one um, that we were talking about last time uh, called, I think, Grub Market. Oh yeah, Grub Market. So Grub Market, very interesting company. They have raised, I don't know, a lot of money. Like <laughs> I, can't, I don't want to quote, but I know it's well over 25 million because that was a while ago. Um, and uh, they do, uh, they basically, this was a Chinese entrepreneur coming to the US. So the other two are, are US entrepreneurs. This was a Chinese entrepreneur coming to the US. He basically um, uh, figured out how to do from the farm to the table basically a very efficient uh, supply chain and online e-commerce site. So people want to order, you know, fresh farm goods, get them on their table. They can do that. I'm sure you get this question a lot, Steve, which is when a company approaches you, you're looking at, you know, intro.vc or talking to a founder, what are some of the, the key components you look for? Um, or maybe some hard no's. 
when you see it, like, this is not a fit for, for me as a VC? Yes. So unfortunately, as a venture capitalist, we have to pass on most things. Like literally, we can only keep track of so many deals. We can only like help people on so many deals. Like if I invest in a deal, I want to participate. Like I want to actually add value that's more than my money, but that requires my time, which is limited. And that's true of most, Silicon, you know, they can only sit on so many boards. So when you go to VCs, usually their money is much more flexible than their time. Like their time is what's really precious to them. And that's why they are very careful about what companies they pick. So when, we, when I choose a company, it's a pretty high bar. So I want a company uh, where the first thing I want, I want the, the I want to look and it can be very early stage, even pre-revenue, even pre-traction, you know, growing, I can still invest. But I want to see one thing. I want to see that that CEO has passed my first test. And this is the most important test that they're going to have to pass. And the first test is that you went out there and built a stellar team. Like you are not doing this alone. Because I will tell you, it's hard enough to do a startup, but doing it alone is really, really hard. So my test is, you know, I think the, the essential quality to be a great CEO is leadership. Like you can fail on everything else, but you cannot fail on leadership. And the first criteria to judging a good leader is, can they bring on amazing people that could have been working for Microsoft or Google or Facebook, but they turned down six figure jobs to come join this startup because they believe that this is going to go somewhere. So I look at who they attracted, why those people joined, I talk to them. And if those align, then I think, well, we can figure it out. We can figure it out together. They may not have exactly the right idea, but that's a really good start. So that's the first criteria. And then, of course, we look at all the things. We look at how big the market is. Do they have any unique technology advantages? What, you know, what, if they're literally, I have two rules for startups, two fundamental rules. If you're going to succeed, there are only two ways to do it. Either one, you look at all the other products out there on the market and you figure out a way, usually using technology, to do something not incrementally better. Because if you do something a little better than all your competitors, you're going nowhere. You're dead, like the startup dead. But you figure out how to do it exponentially better, an order of magnitude, because it literally takes that much to get customers to switch. Nobody wants to switch products. We are all happy with what we're using. We will only switch if there's a super compelling reason. So exponentially better. And if you can't do that, the only other way to break through is to do something different. There are new needs being created, new demand out in the market all the time because markets are shifting, trends are changing, technology is emerging. There are always new trends out there. And you as a CEO have to, if you can identify an area that is untapped, this huge supply of demand, and you can bring it to us and show us that you can meet this need, boom, we're in. Steve, I have one last question. First of all, thank you. Thanks for sharing your story. It's amazing. Everyone should check out founderspace.com to learn more. Um, my last question, are there any other places online we should point people to, to learn more or check out more? So yeah, you can go to founderspace.com if you want my book, which goes, it's written like I talk. So it's very conversational, but filled with information like this. Go to survivingastartup.com. That is my last question, um, Steve, surviving a startup. I would love to hear a favorite story from surviving a startup. And if people want to check out the book, then go to survivingastartup.com. What's, what's a fan favorite story in the book? So one of my favorite stories that I describe in the book is Halo Top Ice Cream. Now, here is an ice cream. For those of you who don't know it, they're a startup. They basically launched this ice cream. And... It is basically an ice cream. It's not good for you, but it's much less bad for you. Like it doesn't, you know, they don't have sugar in it. And it's, you know, you can eat a lot more of this ice cream and be a lot more satisfied without putting on the pounds. However, to launch this company, those guys went through hell. Now, I won't go into the whole story because it's a really uh, dramatic story, but they broke every rule I give entrepreneurs in the book. Like they broke every rule. And I put this story in there to show you that I'm going to give you a lot of rules in this book, but they aren't, they are just rules of thumb. Like they tend to work most of the time, but you can break every one of them if you believe in your company enough. Now, one of the cardinal rules I give people, don't borrow money from friends and family. 
this company did. Like, because, you know, most startups fail. That's why I call it surviving a startup. Like 90% of them just and you never have to met- see them at Thanksgiving. And- right. And, and for the rest of your life, if they'll even talk to you after you lose all their money. So I just say, don't borrow it from family and friends if you want to keep them. Like, get somebody who's an experienced investor to invest. They know what they're doing. Your family and friends are just being nice or they're being delusional like you are. So um, don't take the money from them. I also said, don't take money from loan sharks at super high interest rates. Again, Halo Top did this, but if they hadn't done this, they literally would have died because they came to so many near death misses. They uh, ended up uh, at the end of the day, breaking through. And I'll tell you what enabled them to take these big risks. Number one, they were making a product where they were the customer. The founder of that company really wanted this ice cream for himself. Like, and he, worked on formula after formula after formula, trying it on himself and all his friends over iteratively over and over and over and over. And he knew he had a great product. So he was willing to go all the way. He knew there was a demand for this product. He just had to break through. So if you're an entrepreneur that really knows it, you're not just fooling yourself. Like a lot of entrepreneurs, we we fall in love with our products, but love is blind. Um, We don't know. But if you can really see clearly that you have a winner, then you can take those risks. You can break all the rules. Steve, I want to be the first one to thank you. Everyone check out founderspace.com. Check out survivingastartup.com and in many more episodes. Thanks, Steve. So, thanks so much. And thanks, everyone. Thanks, Jeremy. What I've got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire. Came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. 